So let's talk about the setting of Anthem. The first question to take up is, when does Anthem take place? Does it take place in the past, in the present, in the future? Well, reading the story, there are all kinds of reasons why one might think that Anthem is set in the distant past. For one thing, the society that's depicted in Anthem is incredibly primitive. Equality tells us about all the you know, great modern inventions that come out of the home of the scholars, like how to make glass to put into windows, or he talks about you know, the most recent, the newest invention, the candle. You know, this was only invented 100 years ago. The home of the leaders is considered to be the greatest house in the city. Why is it the greatest house in the city? Well, it's a whole three stories high. How do they tell time in the society of Anthem? Well, Equality tells us that in the courtyard of the home of the street sweepers, there's that super high-tech, modern time-telling instrument, the sundial. So, you know, the state of technology in the society of Anthem is incredibly primitive. What kinds of things is Equality taught in his science classes as a student? Well, in chapter one, he tells us, we learn that the earth is flat and that the sun revolves around it, which causes the day and the night. We learn the names of all the winds which blow over the seas and push the sails of our great ships. We learn how to bleed men to cure them of all ailments. You know, so this is the kind of thing that people believed in the Dark Ages, long before the development of modern science. So is Anthem a work of historical fiction? Is this a novel that is set in the past, in the Dark Ages? Well, other facts make clear that it's actually set in the future. It's set hundreds and hundreds of years in the future. Anthem is set in a, in a distant future that has collapsed into a kind of primitive stagnation. So it's actually set, it, it, it is a kind of Dark Ages society, but it's set in a future Dark Age. So how do we see this? Well, equality tells us about the so-called unmentionable times. So this is a time hundreds and hundreds of years in his distant past, a time long before his era. And he talks about the strange things that existed in these unmentionable times, about the towers which rose to the sky, or the carriages which moved without horses, or the lights which burned without flame. Now clearly these are references to skyscrapers, to cars, to electric lights. So these are things from our modern world today. And for equality, he's referring to these as strange things that existed in some long past distant era. We get another important piece of evidence when equality discovers his tunnel. So what does equality tell us in chapter one when he discovers the tunnel? No man known to us could have built this place, nor the men known to our brothers who lived before us. And yet it was built by men. It was a great tunnel. Its walls were hard and smooth to the touch. It felt like stone, but it was not stone. On the ground there were long, thin tracks of iron, but it was not iron. It felt smooth and cold as glass. So the walls felt like stone, but they were not stone. So he's talking about concrete walls. You know, they don't have concrete in his era, in his society. He's talking about, you know, train tracks, which were made of iron, but were not iron. So obviously he's talking about steel. They don't have processes for making steel in his era. So what is the tunnel? Well, clearly you've got the tunnel, you know, you've got concrete walls, long, thin rails of steel. You know, clearly he's talking about some sort of subway tunnel. And he goes on to tell us, We knew suddenly that this place was left from the unmentionable times. So it was true, and those times had been, and all the wonders of those times. Hundreds upon hundreds of years ago, men knew secrets which we have lost.
Now, initially, Equality might have had some doubts about whether the unmentionable times were even real. You know, he, he tells us this is something that, that the old people whisper about in the home of the useless. You know, people in his era don't really know much about these unmentionable times. This is a period that existed before what they call the Great Rebirth. And people in his society are not actually allowed to or supposed to talk about the times before the Great Rebirth. You know, just talking about this era, just talking about these unmentionable times is a crime that'll get you three years in the Palace of Corrective Detention. So Anthem is set in a world of the future hundreds and hundreds of years after our time. So what happened to our world? What happened in Equality's past that brought about the collapse of our civilization and led to the kind of world that he lives in? Well, he tells us about this in chapter two. We have heard the legends of the great fighting in which many men fought on one side and only a few on the other. These few were the evil ones and they were conquered. Then great fires raged over the land. And in these fires, the evil ones and all the things made by the evil ones were burned. And the fire, which is called the dawn of the great rebirth, was the script fire where all the scripts of the evil ones were burned and with them all the words of the evil ones. Great mountains of flame stood in the squares of the cities for three months. Then came the great rebirth. So all of the knowledge and technology of our world was destroyed in a great war. All the books were burned, all the knowledge was lost. And he tells us that this occurred hundreds and hundreds of years in his past. All of mankind's knowledge and inventions were completely lost. Notice that even the knowledge of how to make a candle was lost to the people, to, was lost to Equality's ancestors. And the knowledge of how to make a candle was something that had to be rediscovered. It was rediscovered a hundred years before Equality's time. So Anthem is set in a world of the future that has collapsed into primitive stagnation. Now this places Anthem into the category of novels, the genre known as the dystopian novel. So Anthem is a dystopian vision of the future. It's a vision of the future that is not a nice vision of the future. It's a depiction of a future society gone wrong, a future society that is, you know, a sort of nightmare world that nobody would want to live in. Okay, so we've established Anthem setting in time. We've established that it's set in a, in a primitive world of the future. What else can we say about Anthem setting? Well, one thing we can say about the society that's depicted in Anthem is that it's an incredibly regimented society. Every aspect of everyone's life is completely controlled by the authorities who rule this society. There's no freedom for anyone to do anything. Every minute of everyone's day is completely controlled and planned out. Equality tells us about his life in the home of the street sweepers. You know, and if you look at it, if you read his description of life in the home of the street sweepers in chapter one, you get a sense of just the absolute monotony of daily life. The bell rings in the morning, everybody gets up. They all get dressed and they shuffle downstairs to have breakfast. You know, they go, they go downstairs and the bell rings and they go off to work sweeping the streets. They come back, they have lunch, the bell rings, and they go off and work again. They come home, they eat. Everything, every minute of the day is controlled and planned out. So they're, you know, they're basically drones who follow orders. Every time the bell rings, they move on to the next activity. There's no time that they have for themselves. There's no freedom to do anything that they want to do. And the same thing applies to the whole course of a person's life. From birth to the age of five, they live in the home of the infants. From age five to age 15, you know, they spend 10 years in the home of the students. And you can imagine there's probably the same you know, monotonous daily routine in the home of the students. 
at age 15, they are given their life mandates. They're assigned to the job that they're going to have for the rest of their life. And then they go off and live in this regimented, controlled way for their entire lives. When they reach the appropriate age and the time of mating rolls around, they're sent off to the palace of mating and assigned a mate by the council of eugenics. When they reach the age of 40, they're considered old and worn out. You know, the society is so incredibly primitive. You know, by the time they reach the age of 40, that's considered old age. And they're sent off to the home of the useless to live out their retirement. Now, he also tells us that, you know, if somebody manages to reach the age of 45, you know, they're considered the ancient ones. So, you know, from dawn to dusk and from birth until death, every minute of everyone's life is completely controlled and planned out by the authorities in the society depicted in Anthem. There's no freedom for any individuals to choose what they want to do. There's no freedom to think. There's no freedom to be alone. So this is a completely controlled authoritarian society. So one aspect of, of Anthem's setting is that the society is incredibly regimented. It's this incredibly controlled authoritarian society. Another aspect of the society is that it is an incredibly repressive society. Equality tells us about a number of the, you know, the kinds of laws that exist in his society. And these are extremely oppressive, severe laws. There are severe punishments, even for the most minor offenses. He tells us right at the beginning that it's against the law to be alone. It's against the law to write without permission. If you steal a candle, that'll get you 10 years in the palace of corrective detention. You're not allowed to speak of the times before the great rebirth, right? So we, we already found out this will get you three years in prison just for speaking about the times before the great rebirth. Men are not allowed to think of women and women are not allowed to think of men except at the time of mating. We even find out that it's forbidden not to be happy. We find out that there's, there's a word and you're not allowed, that you're not allowed to speak. And if you speak this word, that is a crime punishable by death. So the society prescribes these incredibly severe punishments for even the most minor offenses. The punishments are incredibly repressive, incredibly severe. And yet the funny thing is, for the most part, people don't really break the laws in the society. The society that's depicted in Anthem, this is not the sort of totalitarian dictatorship where you have soldiers patrolling the streets every day and you know jackbooted thugs hauling people off to concentration camps. This is not a society where people are constantly rebelling and where these laws have to be imposed by the constant use of force. So it is a totalitarian dictatorship but it's one where for the most part everyone follows the rules. The rules don't really need to be enforced. Generally, people are passive and obedient. You know, when the bell rings in the morning, everybody gets up. When it rings again at night, everybody goes to sleep. People don't really rebel or, or break out or try to fight against the rules in their society. In the world of Anthem, people do what they're told. So the laws are brutally repressive, but for the most part, they don't really have to be enforced. Well, why is this? Well, the explanation has to do with the, the last and probably the most important aspect of the world of Anthem. And that is the ideas and the beliefs that are held by the people in the society. The explanation for this passive obedience lies in the ideas that people hold and that govern their behavior. What kind of philosophy do the people believe in the world of Anthem? What are their moral beliefs? What are their political beliefs? Let's look at some of the things that equality tells us about the ideas, the beliefs in the world of Anthem. Well, one of the important things that people believe in equality's society is that all men must be alike. In chapter one, he tells us, 
We strive to be like all our brother men, for all men must be alike. In chapter 2, we find out it is a sin to give men names which distinguish them from other men. The society's motto carved into marble over the palace of the World Council is, we are one in all and all in one. There are no men but only the great we, one, indivisible, and forever. So the rules and the laws, these incredibly severe laws and the rules of Anthem are designed to crush any individual differences, anything that sets one man apart from any other man. It's designed to crush all aspects of human individuality. The laws are especially designed to crush any personal values or choices. You know, what's the most important moral rule that we learn about in the society of Anthem? It's the one against the transgression of preference. It's considered a sin or a transgression to have any sort of preferences, to prefer one friend over another, to prefer one form of career over another, to prefer one person over another. In the world of Anthem, you are not supposed to have any personal desires or values. If all men are supposed to be alike, and there's not supposed to be any individuality, a personal value is something that's going to break this kind of rule. A personal value is something that sets you apart from others because you have to think for yourself and choose this value. And it also sets other people apart from others. You are, you know, if you have a friend, you're preferring that one friend over all, uh, over all other people. So if the goal of the society is to prevent any sort of individuality, this is why the transgression of preference is one of the most important moral rules. They don't want anybody to be choosing individuals and breaking up the collective. The great truth in the society in Anthem, as we find out in chapter one, is that all men are one and that there is no will save the will of all men together. So, the world of Anthem is a completely collectivist society. Ayn Rand describes collectivism as follows. She says, Collectivism means the subjugation of the individual to a group, whether to a race, class, or state. Elsewhere, she writes, Collectivism holds that the individual has no rights, that his life and work belong to the group, and that the group may sacrifice it at its own whim to its own interests. Now this describes the world of Anthem completely. So the world of Anthem is a completely collectivist world. It's a world where people are expected to merge themselves into the collective whole, to, to merge themselves with the group, and to subordinate their own individual interests, to sacrifice their own individual interests for the sake of the common good. And they've been taught, you know, basically from birth on up, that this is good and that this is right, that this is the right way for society to be. Any sign of individuality or difference is immediately suppressed. You know, this is the reason why the rules are so repressive and why the punishments are so severe for things, you know, that might seem to us to be quite minor, you know, stealing a candle or writing something down. They want to stamp out any possibility of any individuality, any individual differences. They want to stamp that out right away and not allow any tiny bit of it to exist in the society. They want people to accept that their role is to merge into the collective whole. I mean, this is why, for example, it's against the law to be alone. No one is allowed to be alone at any time for any reason, whatever. This is considered, you know, the great transgression. It's regarded as the root of all evil. Being alone is the root of all evil. Why is that? Well, again, people are, are supposed to merge themselves into the collective. Being alone, you know, having time to think for yourself or choose for yourself, this prevents you from merging into the collective. So people are not allowed to be alone. And the whole society is designed to make sure that they never are. So the people in the world of Anthem are taught this all-encompassing philosophy of collectivism. They're taught it from the moment of birth, all throughout their schooling, and for the most part, they generally 
accept it. This is why the people in the society of Anthem are so passive and obedient. This is why there's no need for you know, the constant threat of force or the constant presence of force in the society of Anthem. All their lives, people have been taught this all-encompassing philosophy of collectivism and they have accepted the idea that their role is just to merge into the collective. You know, for the most part, they accept this and this makes them passive and obedient. So let's sum up what we've learned about the world of Anthem. Literarily, Anthem presents a completely unique fictional universe. That the central idea of the story is this world where the concept of I no longer exists. A world where people can't even think of themselves using a singular pronoun. And it tells the story of one man's struggle to rediscover that word and in the process to discover the meaning of man's ego. Now, that one central idea sets all the other aspects of the novel. It's this central idea that makes the you know, first-person journal form of the story the essential vehicle for telling the story. The story of this man's intellectual journey to discover the word I. Having it written in this journal form gives us the window into his mind so that we can see the process that he goes through in struggling to rediscover this word. The central idea also determines the physical setting of time and place. It puts equality into a world in which the struggle that he goes through is necessary. He's placed into the kind of society where he has to go through a journey of intellectual discovery in order to discover the word I and to discover the meaning of individualism. The world of Anthem, in terms of its physical setting, is a primitive world of the future that has collapsed into a stagnant dark age. It's a highly repressive, authoritarian society in which no element of human freedom is allowed. And it's a completely, thoroughly collectivist society designed to crush any aspect of human individuality, individual thoughts, individual values.